and Josh Blackman are long lost brothers who found each other as grown ups. At least it seems that way sometimes. Mr. Shapiro is Senior Fellow in Constitutional Studies at the Cato Institute, and he is Editor in Chief of the Cato Supreme Court Review. His law degree is from the University of Chicago, and he clerked for the Honorable E. Grady <coughs> Jolly of the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Fifth Circuit. Before joining Cato, Mr. Shapiro worked at Cleary Gottlieb and at Patton Boggs, and he was an adjunct professor at George Washington University Law School. He has contributed to many academic, popular, and professional publications. He regularly provides commentary for various television and radio outlets, and he appeared on the Colbert Report in the wake of McDonald. And if you, I sent you a link. If you haven't watched it, you should. I got ready. We can actually just play it. <laughs> <laughs> um, Mr. Blackman, uh, again, is a law clerk in the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Sixth Circuit for Danny Boggs. His law degree is from George Mason. He has published 12 law review articles, was cited by the Seventh Circuit in his Zell versus Chicago, and will begin as an assistant professor at South Texas College of Law in August 2012. Their topic this afternoon is Justice Thomas's concurrence in McDonald, what it, and therefore the Privileges or Immunities Clause, means for future right to <coughs> bear arms related litigation. Great. Thank you. Um, well, thanks very much for, for having us. Uh, it's been a little while since we've uh, done this uh, routine. Um, and possibly, I guess we did it once maybe after McDonald, but uh, most of what we were doing uh, was before McDonald and the run up to it because exactly two years ago we published an article called uh, Keeping Pandora's Box Sealed about the proper way, we were arguing the proper way to extend the right to keep their arms to the states, which is the Privileges or Immunities Clause. In fact, in the academic literature there is no doubt this is not a controversial point as far as uh, you know, whether you're uh, a conservative, a libertarian, or, or a progressive. The These are all of the stories. Right? That's right, that's right. Um, as, as Scalia put during the argument. But uh, it's really kind of a, you know, uh, it's, it's baffling to me that uh, this whole uh, argument about the Privileges and Immunities Clause, incorporation, the meaning of rights, the 14th Amendment, uh, has come about via gun rights. Um, you know, I think uh, at lunch uh, somebody mentioned uh, Northeastern sensibilities. Well, I mean, I'm a you know Russian Canadian Jew, grew up in Toronto. I really don't have, didn't have much exposure uh, to guns. It's not like the wilds of Staten Island that that, that Josh grew up in. <laughs> yeah. Um, so you know, I never expected to be uh, you know invited to talk at NRA things and, and and stuff like that. Not that I've ever been opposed to gun rights or self defense. Quite to the contrary, but it's just. Uh, uh, wasn't and, and still isn't really how I conceive of myself. As I like to say, I'm not a gun nut, I'm a constitution nut. And so when Josh came to me uh, over two years ago uh, with uh, a theory of, uh, hey, this, you know, this thing that, that Alan Gura and the, the stuff that's bubbling up, this is a great way to reconceive all this stuff that you at Cato, I've been at Cato, I guess, two years at that point, uh, have been pushing in terms of the uh, uh, restoring the lost constitution and reconceiving our, our rights and overturning slaughterhouse, these sorts of things. Uh, so let's, and at the same time, tearing a strip off the progressive vision of the same of the Constitution in 2020 project. Um, so that's how this came about. We wanted to mollify uh, as much as we could conservative fears uh, about uh, opening the Pandora's box of the Privileges or Immunities Clause if we, uh, you know, and incorporate or apply the right to keep their arms through privileges or immunities. Well, conservative sphere, doesn't that mean that government then has to not just allow but require uh, triplet uh, uh, gay marriage in federal post offices or, you know, whatever? With midgets. With midgets, yeah, well, you know, that's, I'm not sure if that's a protected class or not. But, um, uh, so that's what that that was what, what our project was, you know, saying, look, this is the more faithful, originalist way of doing it, and it's at at worst no worse than this nebulous. I know when I see it, substantive due process. What is a fundamental right uh, on principle? Uh, on exactly. the Supreme Court did. Well, not quite. We'll get into we'll get into that. We'll get into that. But anyway, um, right before I turn it over to Josh, let me just say that I believe this is the first time we're doing this. Uh, song and dance when both Josh has had a full night's sleep and I'm sober. So we'll see how that goes. The last time we did this was 
New Orleans, and we had spent the night on. No, no, no. Was it Georgetown? Oh, right. right. Okay, so we did it twice. We did it once in New Orleans. Anyway, and get to the stuff. Bourbon Street, and the last time actually. We didn't, do it, we didn't do it on Bourbon Street. <laughs> well, speak for yourself. And so that's actually a good segue. The okay. second time I did this, I'd actually camped out outside the Supreme Court on arguments for McDonald's in Chicago. I slept on the sidewalk. It is very cold. I actually have some sympathy for the occupiers as I did that for one night, uh, but thankfully I'll never do it again. So where are we? McDonald's in Chicago. This all starts really way back when with people like Joyce Malcolm and Don Cates, people in the 80s who had this great idea that the Second Amendment protects the individual rights. And these are living legends in our midst. And they really set the intellectual groundwork which brought us to the present. 2008, DCV Heller. The Supreme Court said, surprise, the Second Amendment means something. We have this individual right to keep and bear arms. Okay, but it only applied to this little federal enclave we find ourselves in now. It only applied to the District of Columbia. So what happens next? Literally within minutes of Heller, uh, one of Alan Burr's associates filed suit in Chicago, saying that the Chicago ban on firearms is unconstitutional. It was one of those draconian in the nation. Uh, and that suit percolated through. And the way Alan Stiles complaint was in two factors. As we all know, the Constitution, as originally written, only applied to the federal government. Federal government. It didn't apply to the states. This is Barrett v. Baltimore. In the after the ratification of the 14th Amendment, rights start to be incorporated or extended to the states. And the Supreme Court did like a hodgepodge approach. Some, some justices said all of them are in, some justices said some of them are in. And they made all these silly testing with implicit in the Constitution of Order and Liberty, for it's deeply rooted in our traditions. It applies to the state. Fine. Since the courts never recognized the Second Amendment as meaning anything, they never addressed the incorporation issue. And that was really what happened to McDonald. So leading up to McDonald, there was a resurgence of looking at history. Now we're not talking about what James Madison and George Mason and Thomas Jefferson thought about guns. We're looking at what John Bingham and the 38th Congress thought about guns. And this is really an important distinction which the courts somewhat adhered to. The history that was relevant to the original inquiry of McDonald wasn't 1787, it was 1868. How did people perceive of the right to keep their arms at the time? And there's one very important clause in the Constitution that's relevant. And if you've ever taken common law, you'll think the relevant provision for incorporation is a contract clause, and you're wrong. The relevant provision is the Privileges or Immunities Clause, which reads, no state shall make or enforce any law which shall abridge the privileges or immunities of citizens of the United States. Now, you must ask, what is a privilege or immunity? What is this? Well, there's a couple of ways we can find out, one of which is you look to Article 4 of the Constitution, which has both privileges and immunities clause. And that was given a very early explication by Joseph Bushrod Washington, a nephew of President George Washington, in a very famous case called Corkville v. Coriel, which was about raking oysters in Connecticut. Uh, I don't eat oysters. He does. And see, last time it's... Last time in New Orleans there was a lot of seafood, so I didn't fare too well. So this, this, you know, took lots of it. It was actually pretty good. So anyway, we, we look at this case of court called the Coriel. So Justice Washington said, what are, what are these privileges and immunities? Well, my view comprehends both locks and oysters. So, you know, <laughs> we need some bagels to wrap this up. So, 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 so Washington said that what are these privileges and immunities? They're these broad kind of natural rights. Thank you. Enjoyment of life and liberty, you know, think of Jefferson and Declaration of Independence. The right to acquire and possess property. It's kind of a locking thing. And the right to pursue happiness and safety. This is Jeffersonian Declaration of Independence. And there are these broad natural rights. Now, the Privileges and Immunities Clause didn't really protect in the same way. But when they ratified the 14th Amendment, there was a real need to protect the rights of people in the states. Look at the times. It was Reconstruction. Uh, the South had just lost the war, and they were basically denying free men of their both basic fundamental rights. So one of the reasons why the Privileges and Immunities Clause came in was a way to protect substantive rights. And what are these rights? They go back to what Corporal Victoria said. And perhaps middle for our purposes, one of the things that everyone agreed at in 1868 was a privilege or immunity of citizenship was the right to bear arms. Uh, think of yourself if you're a freedman in, say, somewhere in the deep south after the Civil War and the Ku Klux Klan was riding through, there was no police to help you because probably most of the police officers were part of the Klan. The only way you could defend yourself was with a gun. And the framers of the Fourth Amendment were very clear. And Justice Thomas's concurrence, which we'll get to in a bit, was very profound on the saying that this is an important aspect of citizenship. You need to be able to defend yourself. So this is one of the privileges or immunities of citizenship. And I'll talk quickly about the slaughterhouse, and I'll go back to you. So we have this great clause, this privileges or immunities clause, that protects these fundamental rights. And you know, it's going well, we got liberty, and then it got slaughtered. In the slaughterhouse case. Uh, it was a really bizarre case also from New Orleans, and actually, uh, I wanted to visit the slaughterhouse. It's actually right across the river, and I didn't get a chance to go there, but I got a picture of it. So there was this case called the Slaughterhouse Cases, where uh, there was a basically the city of New Orleans passed a law saying that if you want to slaughter meat, you have to do it in our butcher, in our slaughterhouse, which had the effect of putting all the ones out of business. It was 
you know, for George Bates people, it was a monopolistic rent-seeking law. You got to keep everything in the province of the state. You pay us, bam. It was a stupid law. And a bunch of butchers saying, hey, you can't do this. This violates our right to earn an honest living. Um, IJ is across the river, but this, this, was, this is their bailiwick. They said, this is our right to earn a free living. And the Supreme Court in a 5 4 opinion said, no, 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 this isn't right. You know, which, which, by the way, is another one of the rights uh, that uh, you know the Congress was concerned about in terms of the freedmen and the, and the freed slaves. You know, it, it, it's not just a nominal freedom; they had to be able to earn a living, protect themselves, all these different things. And contract, and you say liberty of contract, this is one of those things. It was actually the freedmen couldn't sign a contract; they couldn't actually engage in, in, in business transactions with others. But going back to slaughterhouse, the very infamous five-four opinion that everyone thinks is wrong, even like a Keel Mark who's no friend of of the Second Amendment, he thinks it's wrong. And he basically said, the, the court basically said that the privileges or immunities clause only protects these so-called federal rights. It doesn't protect any kind of fundamental natural type rights. For example, one of the rights listed is you have the right to visit the sub-treasuries. You have the right to protection on the high seas. I mean, they're, 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 they're stupid. Basically, he read a clause out of the Constitution um, in, in the slaughterhouse cases. And then so effectively, this clause was dead, and the court in order to protect substantive liberty, turn to the other clause I told you doesn't really matter, but it's the due process clause, which by its term speaks of process, but the court had to imbue it with a substance. It's, it's not completely yes. a, di a direct of, of, of substance, because you can't just have canceling reports. Much like Lily's articles. What's that? Much like Lily's articles. You can't just have... Uh, you can't just have kangaroo reports that are enforcing due process, but because Slaughterhouse eviscerated privileges or immunities, uh, we have this warped conception of, of what the due process uh, clause protects, and it's kind of unprincipled, unmoored uh, from text and history. And more for more on what the due process clause actually does protect, uh, it's not nothing, it's, uh, there is little bits of substance to, again, protect, prevent the kangaroo courts. I would recommend an article by Tim Sanderfer in the New York Journal of Law and Liberty, the NYU Journal of Law and Liberty from two years ago. Yeah, it all goes back to Magna Carta, the law of the land, the notion that there's just yeah. substance component to process, but that's Sanderfer's argument. But, but essentially, because the court was able to protect these fundamental rights or privileges of immunities, they said, okay, what's next? And they just, you know, the court <coughs> right to the next sentence, okay, due process. And throughout the 20th century, rights protected through the due process clause. And that was probably wrong as an originalist matter, but we now have 80 years of precedent. Now bring this back to the future, and we go 88 miles per hour right to the Supreme Court, and we see that the Supreme Court considering the incorporation of a right, and they haven't done this in a few decades. The last one, I think, was in the 70s or something. 69, Benton versus Maryland. Bob DeWalt is a man. He knows these numbers. So uh, the court hasn't done this in quite some time, so they were confronted with this, and Allen and others, and people Cato and elsewhere, are saying, okay, we have a chance to perhaps give the privileges of the use clause some meaning. Let's, let's restore its original meaning. We have, we have Thomas, we have, we have Scalia, we have Roberts, we kind of have Alito, Ken, I don't know Kenny, but you know, we, have, we have these originalists in the court, and we have a shot to do this. And that's why we wrote this article about two years ago. That's why my colleagues will pick it up. And, and it's important because, of course, the, the nature of the right to keep our arms is still very much undefined, and so that's what we'll, we'll end with. But anyway, the first step in uh, using the privileges or reviving privileges or immunities is understanding that uh, what the 14th Amendment extends to the states, uh, regardless of uh, you know, which clause it is, is liberty and not clauses. So the fourth, you know, never in the ratification debates do you see talk of, well, we are simply now going to apply the Bill of Rights to the states. Otherwise, the clause would say those you know, first eight amendments to the Constitution are now applied to the states. Um, you know, instead, it talks of due process, it talks of privileges or immunities, it talks of equal protection. Um, uh, and, and to understand what all those mean, and, and, and to understand the original public meaning, of course, as Josh alluded, you have, to be, you have to do originalism at the right time, which in this case is 1868, the time of the 14th Amendment's ratification, not 1791. Uh, and in 1868, uh, when the 14th Amendment was ratified, the term incorporation, as we know it today, would have been seen as a misnomer, a constitutional malapropism, really. Uh, Ilya loves that line. Uh, it, it, it misunderstands what the 14th Amendment protected and, and how it protected against state oppressions. Uh, the concept of incorporation itself was anachronistically inserted into our jurisprudence when the court went about doing this selective incorporation that it had to after slaughterhouse and eviscerated privileges or immunities. To the extent the Reconstruction Congress sought to limit the power of the states to infringe certain rights, the 14th Amendment, as I said, didn't merely copy the 1791 understanding of the first eight amendments in the Bill of Rights. Instead, it sought to protect certain liberties held by the people, what are known as privileges or immunities. Those are synonymous with natural rights, liberties in, 18th century, in 19th century speak. Uh, 
uh, from being infringed by the states. And again, in the words of Akhil Omar, Section 1 of the 14th Amendment means not just more than mechanical incorporation, but also less. So again, uh, it might protect the exact same uh, scope of the right to keep and bear arms as the Second Amendment does. It might protect more, it might protect less. But the Second Amendment is simply the codification of what that right was understood to be in 1791. In 1868, we have to look at what privileges or immunities meant at that time, or, or whatever the liberties were at that time that the 14th Amendment uh, text was intended uh, to, to protect. Think of it almost like a VHS and a DVD. They both got the same content, but they're in different forms. And essentially what people say is, you know, uh, you got to take a VHS and jump into a DVD player. And that doesn't exactly work. They'll be very similar, but they're just different in form. That's a good way to historically think about these different exceptions of the right. So what does that mean now if we're trying to apply a particular right or understand how far a particular right uh, extends uh, to the states? Well, a good way of, of looking at it, we don't have to invent something from whole cloth. I mean, the, the Washington versus Glucksburg test is pretty good. So we look at whether a particular right is uh, deeply rooted in the nation's history and traditions. and uh, figure out what a careful description uh, of that right would be. So, um, you know, maybe there's a, tr at a point where you can make a salient ju judgment of whether the, that is protected. So, um, uh, you know, at the, in 1868, during originalism at the right time, uh, was the right to carry a gun down the street protected? Was that considered to be a, 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 a traditional right that we had? I think Kramer shaking said yes, just just for us. Okay, okay, good, good. Was you know was taking it to uh, you know in, in your in your in your carriage as you were driving down the street? I mean, all these different things that you could look at. What you know, you you, you can't obviously go down to such a fine level of, of generality as you know. Does it allow uh, you know 15 uh, bullets rather than 12 in your clip? Uh, but we should look at whether, you know, what kind of ammunition was allowed to be carried or bought and sold and, and, and so forth. Um, so, you know, the analogy breaks down, but it's imperfect, you know, and, and in fact, we don't have to fully define, the court doesn't have to fully define at any one time the full scope of that right, the right to keep your arms, or, or any. Um, but anyhow, when, when we came to McDonald, you know, and, and, and at the same time, it, the court doesn't have to say that everything that has developed under substantive due process is wrong. It just says, okay, that's our jurisprudence, but we're starting this new line under privileges or immunities, which is a truer, or more doctrinally faithful, or, or what have you. But anyhow, that brings us to, to McDonald versus Chicago, where there's a circuit split um, in, in various courts, the Nordyke case out of the Ninth Circuit, the NRA case uh, out, of the, out of the Seventh Circuit, and this curious case involving nunchucks uh, out, of the, out, of the, out, of the, out of the Second Circuit. Luckily, the court didn't take that one, because then they would have been you know, held up on whether nunchucks and arm and all of this other stuff. That was opinion. She wrote that. She wrote that opinion, indeed. But the question presented that the, that the Supreme Court ultimately took was Allen's. Uh, and that's key, because his, uh, his part, the McDonald case, uh, as separate from the NRA's case, was whether the Second Amendment right to keep and bear arms is incorporated as against the states by the 14th Amendment's privileges or immunities or due process clauses. Uh, and in all of the briefing that Allen presented, he, he put... Um, the PRI clause uh, front and center, and that's what the court took uh, over Chicago's objections and more broader than what um, the NRA and, and Mr. Holbrook uh, were pushing. Now, I don't want to you know, bite the hand that feeds me too much, uh, but uh, I think the NRA did not play a helpful role at the Supreme Court stage because in hiring Paul Clement, who um, is a, a good friend of mine, and in fact, I, I'm making a living right now just commenting and filing briefs and uh, all of the cases that Paul Clement has before the Supreme Court. Uh, you but all I, of them? I, I, think, I think it's up to seven or eight this, this term. Certainly right? really all the high profile ones, yeah. Um, uh, and it's unfortunate that a lot of conservatives, uh, I'll call the conservative position kind of the, the NRA position, were again afraid of this, um, you know, uh, uh, polygamous midget uh, gay marriage in federal post offices, wanted, didn't want to open up the Pandora's box of privileges or immunities. Uh, even though that the case's outcome validated the concerns of the, about the potential lack of five votes for a substitute due process incorporation, there were not five votes. Um, the result also demonstrated the utility of an originalist argument in swaying votes even for due process incorporation. Uh, and we saw the realized benefits of attracting the support of non-traditional allies, including so-called progressive or, or new textualist uh, originalists like Doug Kendall and Paul oh, Akhil Amar and Larry Tribe and, and, and all of these all people. And Jack Balkin, exactly. You know, they, they, they agreed that uh, uh, on an originalist approach in, in certain respects, but 
Um, you know, ultimately, we did get one vote for it, and uh, you're spoiling. We didn't get there yet. Oh, we haven't gotten there yet. I guess I'll uh, turn it over to you for a discussion of what Donald, what mm -hmm. Donald actually did. Don't never go to a movie with him. Let's tell you what happened. Anyway, Ilya, you're not allowed to take any more refreshments in the back then, or you just actually pulled your uh, pulled, pulled your funding for uh, for <coughs> just some bagels and lots. So you're done. Anyway, so brings us to was it March 12, 2009? I think that was the date, or give, give or take two or three days. So, yeah, I spent the entire night sleeping outside the Supreme Court. It's very cold, and the sprinklers do come on really late at night, even in March. I don't know why, because to keep the, keep the grass green. And I woke up this morning, and Ilya came, because he's a member of the Supreme Court bar, and strolled in casually. Um, and it was a very interesting case. Um, I won't focus too much on arguments, but we'll focus on the opinions. Um, like Ilya said, there was not five votes for any one position. There were only four votes for the right to incorporate through substance of due process. You got four votes for saying that the right should not be incorporated. And you had, in the middle, Justice Clarence Thomas saying, nope, not going to join you guys. I'm only going to concur saying the right to be brought to the states with the privilege of the opinions. So let's just go through the opinion. So Justice Alito, not just a Scalia, the author of Peller, which, which you can speculate ad infinitum, perhaps you couldn't keep the majority, who knows why. But Alito had the majority, and he basically went through all the history and did all that jazz, and then he had this kind of newfangled incorporation test. Like Bob Nesh before, there really hasn't been an incorporation test since like the late 1960s. So none of the justices were, I think, even like out of law school when that test was concluded. So they really did have a solid uh, a test of what to do. So there was this Palco test, which said you incorporate something that's implicit in the concept of word liberty. You had Duncan v. Louisiana, which said, if it's, it should be incorporated if it's necessary to an Anglo-American <coughs> We had Glucksburg, which was Illinois really kind of like, which said, that's been deeply rooted in the nation's history of tradition. So, I mean, you got these three tests, what are you gonna do? I'll just throw them together. So here is the test, if a right to be incorporated, okay? It must, just, the court must decide whether the right is fundamental to our system of order liberty, or as we said in related context, whether the right is deeply really rooted in this nation's history of tradition. They basically just jammed together, kind of like a hodgepodge of all different rights. Um, he didn't explain that, and I frankly don't think it matters much, because going forward, there's really not that much more incorporation. One of the few other rights that has been incorporated is the right to a unanimous jury verdict. Um, you might know this, but in Oregon, you can have less than a unanimous jury and still be convicted. And there was this bizarre case called Apodaca in the 70s, where it was like a really split plurality opinion where the court couldn't come up with an opinion. And last year, the court actually just denied certiorari in a case concerning that. So that's the way it's the court saying that this is a dead, dead issue. Now, one thing that's most noteworthy is that the court only spent 172 words on Justice Thomas' concurring opinion. They didn't refute it because they couldn't. They, there wasn't ground to. They just said stuff like, we declined to disturb slaughterhouse. We know it's wrong. But, well, you know, it's, it's what are the Indeed, bridge, none, of the, none of the judge, justices ended up, uh, not, not, not the plurality, not the dissenters, ended up uh, disputing anything that Thomas said. What the plurality did, I mean, first, uh, Justice Scalito acknowledged that quote. You said Scalito. Scal uh, <laughs> they are two different people, you know. Uh, so first, Justice Alito said that, uh, quote, many legal scholars dispute the correctness of the narrow slaughterhouse interpretation. Well, of course, this is an understatement akin to noting that you know, many astrophysicists uh, believe the Earth is essentially round and revolves around the sun. Uh, but nevertheless, this was an important step in overcoming the slaughterhouse court's uh, medieval work view, as it were, uh, of Covid's remunities. Right, and so that was Alito's opinion. And I mean, it's long, it's originalist, maybe it was Scalia, maybe it was Alito, it doesn't really matter who wrote it. But the fact is they didn't touch TRI because they couldn't. They didn't have a good well, argument. Well, another thing that Alito said why he didn't touch, uh, and why the plurality didn't touch uh, slaughterhouse or PRI was, uh, because scholars who think Slaughterhouse was wrong are unable to arrive at, quote, a consensus on the question about the scope of unenumerated rights. Why they need to figure out the full scope of this is, is beyond no, me. Because, no, I mean, it's like to continue the, the metaphor, uh, I mean, astrophysicists adopting the, you know, uh, uh, Earth is round, the Copernican view rather than the Ptolemaic, still disagree among themselves uh, regarding whether, for example, Pluto is a planet. Or what have you. I mean, you don't. You don't need to. Uh, in no Supreme Court case does the court say, "And here is the full uh, 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 extent and consequences of the doctrine that we're announcing today." They're not. They, they decide things case by case. It's just a, a bizarre treatment because they didn't want to deal with it. Right. And if you look at any of the substantive right cases in the sixties or seventies, courts always move in slow increments. They they start slow. They define the rights and they go to court. Blah blah blah. So it was just a specious argument, but they didn't want to touch it because it was water under the bridge. So Scalia's opinion was more or less just a, a punch in the back to John Paul Stevens as he left the court, saying that you're wrong, living originalism is wrong, uh, have a nice trip, see you next fall, I won't read your book. 
Uh, and also, but note the contradiction between Scalia's concurrence and um, and his opinion in Stop the Beach Renourishment, the uh, judicial takings case, where he excoriated uh, Kennedy for using substantive due process uh, to get at that property right claim rather than uh, judicial taking, a, a, you know, a novel, you know, rediscovered uh, theory. So Trevor Burst and I wrote a large article about that called Scalia's Shifting Sands. So, I, I mean, Scalia is not the most consistent person. No, in <laughs> fact, he only spent 55 words, five, five, that's it, discussing why he's a why is agreeing to go through substance and due process, even after calling it like the most evil thing? Babble, babble, babble. Uh, it's just, I mean, yeah. I mean, his entire crusade against substance and due process in the last almost three decades has been so strong. And you just kind of just shoot it away in 55 words, uh, which I... We just have to get over it, Josh. Get, get over, <laughs> it. Get over it. Get over it. Get over it. Dudes, get over it. It's fine. And then speaking of getting over it, we can go to Justice Breyer, <clears throat> who hasn't gotten over it. But let me, he hasn't even gotten over hell. No, he hasn't. Let, let me go back to Justice Thomas. Um, Justice Thomas's opinion, as we said, was concurring in judgment only, meaning without his fifth vote, the case would have been dead. We would have some bizarre situation where the second one applies to D.C., but not to the states. It would have been some anomalous holding. So Thomas said, I believe this case presents an opportunity to re-examine and begin the process of restoring the meaning of the 14th Amendment agreed upon by those who ratified it. And this is an originalist opinion at the right time. He went through the entire history of the antebellum South, and, 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 and what the rights of arms meant to the freedmen and how they could protect themselves and the rights and the liberties from the marauding clan. Um, he opined in the privileges and immunities clause, said this is a superior alternative, and that returning to this meaning will give the 14th Amendment what it, its, original, its original meaning. Um, he also rejected all substance of due process, which we still have to see how he handles the next substance of due process case, because he said it's all baffling. I mean, he, he went on the ledge, because I think there's But no except when it's not, Josh, you forget it. Oh, right, right, right. Well, if it is when it is. Um, he talked about Corporal v. Coriel. He talked about the privileges of media's term of art. Uh, he left open the issue of unenumerated rights, including the right to earn a living. That was the very right at issue in the slaughterhouse case. Uh, and, and so that might give some hope to our friends at IJ and elsewhere uh, about using PRI as a tool going forward. Um, Justice Stevens had a dissent, and as I say, one is the loneliest number. Um, no one joins him. Um, even in, in Heller, Breyer dissented and Stevens dissented, and they both, you know, shook hands and they joined each other's dissents. McDonald, no one joined Stevens' dissent. Um, it's somewhat bizarre. He tries to resurrect his Harlan's or corporation method from a dissent in Toby Olin, which no justice has ever accepted, but he said is clearly established in court law. And Stevens also went through his alternative reading of the history of the Second Amendment. Um, and really, it was just kind of a, a back and forth between Justice Scalia, and then they, 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 they've waged this war, and I guess Scalia outlived Stevens, or I don't know which. which Scalia, Scalia, Scalia won. So I think it was kind of like a valedictory dissent, and no one joined it. Now we get to Justice Breyer. Um, and I didn't talk too much about Justice Breyer earlier today, but, but it's really his pragmatic style arguments that I think really represent the next wave of what we need to discuss. Um, I think Scalia has provided a, a sufficient intellectual and historical counterweight to Breyer's recitation of facts, but I don't think we've actually done a good <coughs> job countering Breyer's arguments that the Second Amendment is different from all the forms of substantive liberty, that it puts others at risk. That's why I think discussion of social cost of the Second Amendment, both with respect to safety society, both with respect to individual liberty, is an important discussion. And that's for another topic. So Breyer made three points. He said, hell is wrong. Um, which is somewhat bizarre because Supreme Court justices are supposed to be bound by their own precedent. I mean, <laughs> during your confirmation hearing, Justice Sotomayor, when asked by Heller, said it is it is the law of the land. And then, you know, a couple months later, she joined opinion saying it's not. So, uh, I don't know. Make a, that was actually Dave Copel's, I think she had a piece in the Washington Times, but give yes. credit. There we go. So, he said, hell was wrong. But even assuming that hell was right, just our view window, as our as lawyers are off to do, he said the Second Amendment should not be incorporated. Um, and then he gave historical arguments about why it's different from all their rights. And I think that's, you know, Manish and Amalala said, why is this right different from all their rights? You know, it's not. It, it, rights are dangerous. Speech is dangerous. Miranda is dangerous. We have dangerous rights. The exclusionary rules, right? The exclusionary rules. Actually, the first sentence of the article is also, why, why is this right different from all their rights? And I got some good feedback from it. I think it's a good point. And then finally, Breyer made the point of putting everything else aside, more people will die. Um, think of the children. Think of the children. Um, you know, and, and that's really the argument that Breyer's making, that history is irrelevant to him. I mean, he, he, he cites some history and he says, well, my historians are smarter than your historians. You know, uh, you know, Carl Bogus is more smart than Stephen Halbert. I mean, you can just argue about that all, all day. But, um, you know, the, his point came down to pragmatism. How should we evaluate the social implications with multi-factor balancing tests? 
And now my Ilya will. Yeah, well, so why did we go? Sorry. Your brother. Right. So why did we go through all this? I mean, did we assume that none of you read McDonald or or sort of forgotten about it? Uh, no. Um, uh, there's a future of this Second Amendment litigation, obviously, which has been covered by other people and, and will be. You know, violent misdemeanors, the gun range in Chicago, uh, emergency restrictions or, or restrictions in times of emergency. Uh, uh, Legislators being gun designers, that if your barrel is at such and such an angle, it's okay, but if not, it's an assault weapon. Uh, the size of your clips, all these different things are, you know, we obviously have the third wave of litigation, right? Um, and, uh, you know, the only two Supreme Court precedents now are Heller and McDonald, which don't say very much to this. Uh, but the opinions in, in McDonald, obviously, are, are very important. And here's why Justice Thomas's. Um, <coughs> Uh, opinion uh, lives on because again it's a necessary it wasn't some outlying superfluous concurrence it wasn't a solo dissent it was the necessary fifth vote so uh, you know game on as Rick Santorum would say with respect to the the privileges uh, or immunities clause and see as, as 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 Josh and I wrote in an op-ed after McDonald uh, was decided this is a way to use guns uh, to protect uh, liberty and the, the broader things I mean all of the Second Amendment litigation uh, again with due respect to um, the NRA and, and, and protecting gun rights is almost beside McDonald's point. Uh, the right at issue here, uh, the one triggering, as it were, this fascinating seminar on corporation doctrine, uh, involved guns. But nowhere in McDonald will you find a discussion of, as I said, the constitutionality of licensing or registration requirements, concealed carry, firearm or ammunition purchasing limits, uh, assault weapon bans, and, and so forth. Much like Heller, which only decided that the Second Amendment protected an individual right uh, not connected to militia service. McDonald, quote, merely uh, said that this right, whatever its scope, offered protection against all levels of government. In neither case did the court even attempt to sketch out the line between constitutional and unconstitutional gun laws. But that's not surprising or disappointing, because it wasn't asked to. That wasn't the case of controversy before it. What makes McDonald interesting and significant um, therefore, isn't what it said about the right to keep and bear arms or incorporation of that right against the states. Both of those things were pretty much foregone conclusions. But precisely Justice Thomas's concurrence, what it said about rights generally, and this is again where my main interest is. What rights do we have and how do we come to have them? Which constitutional prote provisions protect them? If we accept that the Constitution protects rights that aren't explicitly enumerated, as we must if we're to give effect to the Ninth Amendment, if it's something other than an inkblot, then what's the scope of those unenumerated rights? And which state laws are now in jeopardy? These are the real questions that are McDonald's progeny. Um, and what's McDonald's children, like they're all McDonald's children. Yes, yes. Uh, so again, this is why, this is, you know, in stirring passages detailing the state oppressions before and after the Civil War, Thomas showed the reasons for the Civil Rights Act of 1866 and then the 14th Amendment. Freed slaves needed guns to defend themselves, sure. Uh, which is partly why extending the right to keep bare arms is so important. But as I said before, they also needed the freedom to secure employment in a variety of uh, professions to keep the fruits of their labors and to engage in economic transactions, the contracts of the mentioned. <coughs> These sorts of rights don't ex appear explicitly in the text of the 14th Amendment. Uh, but in reviewing the speeches of the framers and the ratifiers in 1868, <coughs> at the right time, uh, you find that unenumerated rights were very much understood to be constitutionally uh, protected. And so Justice Thomas's forceful uh, scholarly opinion will influence litigation that has uh, lots to do with the Second Amendment and the right to keep our arms sure, but even more to do with broader rights, uh, like those economic liter liberties that Slaughterhouse disparaged and that were subverted by the infamous Caroline Products footnote 4. So every complaint challenging the uh, capricious laws impeding the fundamental right to earn a living, such as arbitrary licensing restrictions and other irrational barriers to entry, um, will now cite Thomas's McDonald concurrence. <coughs> His opinion will also strengthen challenges to the pervasive regulatory state of all times that has unintended consequences on the right to keep and bear arms, among other rights. So when you think about it, and quite apart from the overarching question about the scope of federal power, legislation such as TARP and Obamacare and Dodd-Frank and the rest of it uh, offends a host of unenumerated rights protected by the Privileges or Immunities Clause as well. Significantly, even though Alito didn't adopt Thomas's approach, even though the plurality didn't, he took great pains not to reject or criticize it. And McDonald as a whole thus represents a crucial first step down the path to constitutional liberty and opens the door, not to Pandora's box, but to reviving a powerful constitutional provision. 
Thomas's clarion call for a liberty-focused originalism provides a foundation on which to build. Um, and this isn't just, you know, some libertarian crusade or party line that I'm expounding. Uh, because, look, in, the, in, the, in Supreme Court history, solo or minority opinions that introduce novel ideas often start with a trickle. Uh, these arguments swirl and strengthen and eventually flow into a sea change of constitutionalism. Look no further than John Marshall Harlan's opinion in Plessy versus Ferguson, which argued that separate is not equal. That, of course, became Brown v. Board. Or Justice Ober, uh, Owen Roberts' opinion in Haig versus CIO, which has become canonical within First Amendment law regarding free speech rights in the public square. Or Griswold versus Connecticut. I mean, this isn't just, you know, rock rib conservative red meat rights. Uh, Justice White was the only one who squarely held that a state ban on the sale of contraceptives deprived married couples of substantive liberty under the Due Process Clause. Or Justice Robert Jackson in the steel seizure case, right? His concurrence has now become uh, the framework by which the President's foreign policy powers have been judged. And law students 25 years from now might similarly look back to Justice Thomas's opinion in McDonald as most akin to Justice Lewis Powell's opinion in Backey, right? The University of California case, which uh, unfortunately allowed race to play a factor in university admissions and 25 years later led to Bruder. Uh, you know, hopefully, Justice Thomas's uh, opinion won't, lose, won't lead to some sort of, you know, 25-year arbitrary protection of certain rights. Uh, but you know, again, that is the precedent here. Um, in one respect, Thomas's position in McDonald is even more noteworthy than Harlan's was in Plessy, uh, or, um, uh, or or Powell's in Bakke, because Thomas represented the decisive fifth vote for a majority judgment rather than a dissent or a superfluous concurring vote. And so in this one opinion, Justice Thomas has shown the way for the Privileges or Immunities Clause, long hidden under the constitutional floorboards, to protect our most fundamental freedoms, including, but certainly not limited to, the right to keep their arms. Yeah, uh, I, I actually completely agree with Justice Thomas's uh, uh, concurrence on the Privileges or Immunities Clause, but... I would point out there's two reasons why I can I can see why um, NRA played it safe and made the due process argument, and also uh, why the justices were generally reluctant to go down what is clearly, an, which I think they even acknowledge, at least privately, is the right path. And that is, um, think of all of the tremendous number of decisions that have been made based on due process, and now imagine what happens. Uh, I mean, it would be the Full Employment Act for the rest of time for American lawyers uh, re-litigating the claim of, well, if if due process wasn't really the right way to apply this to the states and we have to reapply it through privileges or immunities, privileges or immunities applies to citizens, whereas due process applies to people. There's also Look. equal protection which applies to persons. You can wrap that around. Right. I, I think that's a fair point, uh, but I don't know why you would have to disturb the precedents. In fact, in Thomas's opinion, he makes it clear you don't have to disturb the precedents. I mean, there's lots of precedents which are probably on shaky ground. I mean, <laughs> the court was only originalist, you know, until like five years ago or something. So there are a lot of precedents which are not grounded in originalism, and I don't see like you know motions for TROs trying to but stop laws. Justice King said we're all originalists now. Well, <laughs> we're all originalists. What does originalism mean? But well, yeah. I mean, it really comes down to stare decisis. Uh, I mean, it, just by deciding this under PRI and making it more textually faithful doesn't mean that you overturn the other things simply because they're wrong. I mean, there's a huge reliance interest, obviously. Uh, but moreover, in terms of judicial, preventing judicial mischief, um, you know, to the extent that some sort of due process allows, you know, I made fun of the, 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 the polygamous midget gay marriage in federal post offices and so forth, but, you know, whether it be gay marriage, whether it be, you know, whatever uh, your most horrific example of a, of a right that shouldn't be guaranteed by the Constitution, there's much more leeway for, you know, you get some court 100 years from now um, that, that, you know, just find that by scratching their chin to be fundamental. Versus if you do it under the privileges or immunities clause, where there actually is a textual and contextual and historical base, um, you know, at worst, it's no worse. But I, I'm agreeing with you. I'm just saying Lawrence v. Texas, for example, would not survive. 32 of 37 states had criminalized all oral and anal sex in 1868. I, I'm going to call a halt to this purely because I'm so exhausted. <laughs> I got a little bit of a break, so so. Do we have time for Dave Hardy's yeah, question? Dave is my sure. Oh, sure. Two brief points. Well, both one, hands up. one is uh, Clayton's hypothetical or thought uh, actually, I think, plays a role in reality. I spoke to the former dean of University of Arizona Law School, and she said before the oral argument, they'd had Scalia there, 
and she spoke with Scalia about uh, the pending McDonald case, and he had some vague interest, and then she said, you do realize that if you go under privileges and immunities, corporations are not citizens, and therefore will have no incorporated rights, and Scalia looked back at her and said, that's absurd. So that's not entirely theory. That may have been at the heart of the case, or at least of his opinion. Uh, the second thing is, of course, in the Heller dissents, the Heller dissents assume that the right to bear arms is linked to uh, empowering the states to offer military resistance to the national government if they feel it's necessary. That may have been a large part of the motivation of the framers of 1789, but how do you attribute it to the framers in the Reconstruction Congress? Because that sounds a whole lot like what had just happened between 1861 and 1865. Yes. I'd suggest that understanding was about as likely in the Reconstruction Congress as their intention of putting a statue of Jefferson Davis in the rotunda and making Robert Edward Lee's birthday a national holiday. <laughs> Which is why the individual right to keep and bear arms was stronger in 1868 than it was in 1791. Yeah. And Dave Popel, for the win? Yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll be, try to speak quickly to wrap up. So, Dallas. Um, I agree with 97% of what you said, but would it amend that? <laughs> well, I know that. Due process is not as, protecting substantive rights is not as crazy as Justice Scalia and perhaps uh, you suggested. It's no person shall be deprived of life, liberty, or property without due process of law. You can go all the way back to Justice Chase's opinion in Calder versus Bull in the 1790s, in which he says if you have a law that is, if, you, if the legislature says we're going to take A's property and give it to B, that would obviously be unconstitutional. Since I could scarcely even call it a law. The point is there are some things that government does which may have all the procedural correctness of how a legislature should do things, but simply by the substantive nature of their content can't be law. And that's why when the Supreme Court did what is today incorrectly called incorporation, this first step of incorporating, that that's how McDonald majority describes it, the Fifth Amendment's takings clause against the states in Chicago versus Burlington and Quincy Railroad in 1897, they never mentioned the Fifth Amendment. They were making the point that when you're taking the, the Burlington and Quincy Railroad's property and giving it to somebody else, namely themselves, that can't be due process of law because it can't be law. That, that's all been sort of forgotten by many, um, except Richard Epstein. Um, <laughs> these days, but it's, the point is the, the Supreme Court's early decisions, which are called incorporation decisions, including Gitlow incorporating the first part of the First Amendment in the 1920s, never even thought about whether, it's not the point of the First Amendment, it's that the, the same right that is protected in the First Amendment is by the nature of due process of law, protected by due process of law, the First Amendment had never been written, it would still be protected. And actually, I think Justice Stevens' point makes that very well, and his, his, dissent, his dissent is significantly correct when he says if the Second Amendment had never been written, people would still have a right to have guns and to use them for self-defense. Although it then makes the error of saying it could be substantially that lots of local restrictions are okay within his concept of due process. Secondly, I guess I would I would just quickly disagree on your notion that the NRA wasn't helpful in the McDonald litigation. They there were four votes on the NRA theory one vote on the, the Guerrero Privileges or Immunities Theory, and it took the team to both do it and both to separately argue it. And you, you, you didn't discuss the oral argument, but in, in contrast to the Heller oral argument where I was one of the was assisting Alan at the council table, and Justice Scalia was very nice to him and helped him out and says, well, what you mean to say is things like that. He ripped into Alan immediately and, and quite nastily. It was like, he was very offended that, that Alan was even arguing privileges or immunities which seems kind of unfair because they did grant cert and ask the question. You know, it was a question. And, but anyway, and the, the rest of the court, except for Justice Thomas, who doesn't speak very often of oral arguments, was also quite hostile to oral argument and is described by the nation's greatest Supreme Court reporter, Lyle Denniston. They were, the justices were quite hostile to uh, not only Allen, also to the Chicago lawyer who had an untenable position given the extremist position his client wanted to argue, and they were relieved when the NRA's attorney, Paul Clement, got up to argue and just gave him the good old-fashioned due process, very standard presidential thing. Don't worry too much about you know the original meaning, and that that's what they want. 
And so it, it was the combination of Allen's unorthodox and correct historical approach and the NRA's more conventional presidential approach that were necessary together uh, for that the end. The NRA was superfluous. Allen briefed, with due respect both to you, Dave, and, and the NRA, Allen briefed the substitute process stuff. Uh, it was in all the briefings. Uh, I mean, indeed, it, it, you know, you, you didn't need the NRA to tell the justice how to do that. A, you know, a, a, a bright 1L or an average 2L to write that opinion in their sleep. Um, or a Cato intern. Well, no, that's above, a, that's above an average 2L. So. Um, yeah, okay, but so so what I'm saying is they didn't need, I mean, however hostile they were to Allen, uh, you know, if in the absence of the NRA, Scalia, Alito, Roberts, Kennedy were not going to all of a sudden agree with Chicago. And Allen was, you know, perfectly, he, you know, he presented both sides as any good lawyer was, and he argued both sides, and, um, you know, they, they yeah, but uh, you know, who knows why they wanted Paul Clement to, to, to Yeah, but did, Tom, did Thomas need Allen to tell them, him about the Privileges or Immunities Clause? So I guess we didn't need oral argument at all. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to end it. And I will say that uh, Nelson Lund, and anybody who doesn't know Nelson Lund, you got a folks invite. Yeah. Um, Nelson Lund's comment was, McDonald was decided as soon as they granted cert. <laughs> yeah. So did they need oral arguments? Let's ask Nelson. I repeat, McDonald was decided as soon as they granted cert. Yeah. So at any rate. Um, thank you very much. Before next up, there's somebody here I want to introduce. Um, there aren't a whole lot of women here. There aren't a whole lot of women involved in this issue. And Sandy, pop up. That is Sandy Froman, who is a Harvard Law grad, and more important to what I'm saying, from 2005 to 2007, she was the president of the National Rifle Association. So there are women involved in this issue. Thank you, Alice. And next up, Dave Hardy will speak on congressional implementation under Section 5 of the 14th Amendment. Many of you are too young to remember what it took to enforce Brown. If the executive branch doesn't...